Well, everybody, thank you for coming along and watching my channel. And today I'm going to do another Hurst shifter video. I got a new Hurst shifter in this box. Now, I've done a lot of rebuilding videos of Hurst shifters, but today I'm going to kind of reveal my secrets on how I build new shifters. You see, any shifter that comes out of this place gets a complete rework before it goes out the door. So it's what I sell is a lot different than what the retailers or the big retailers, I should say, sell when it comes to these shifters. We do a little bit more value that we add to them so that you can get a shifter that really performs well. So I'm going to take apart a new shifter, show you some of the idiosyncrasies and show you some of the corrections I do and the little trick parts I make for them. So the other thing I want to do is thank everyone who subscribed to my channel. I was really hoping to kind of hit like 100,000 subscribers. I don't know what I was thinking, but I hit like about I think 75,000 by the time this video came out, which is really much appreciated. If you can really subscribe to my channel, I would really appreciate it and also share my videos. That would mean a lot to me. Also, I want to thank everyone who's used the Buy Me A Coffee links on prior videos and it'll also be in this video. The Buy Me A Coffee funds go into me purchasing new parts and new things to you know, do videos on. Now, oftentimes people ask me to uh, do a video on this transmission or that transmission. I don't really ignore them, but I keep it in the back of my head. And if I can come across a core that I can find at a decent price, I'll buy it. You know, doing videos for just any transmission requires purchasing new parts and the core unit. And most of the time, I just kind of give it away at, at what it costs me if I can, because some of them are hard to sell, to be honest with you. So, Again, let's get to this video, and I hope you like it, and I hope you like my secrets. And thanks for watching. All right, so here we have our basic new Hurst shifter. Again, this is the 8014 shifter assembly. Less to stick, it's called an 8010 assembly. But what I want to show you is the gap right over here. Look at this gap between the 3 4 shift gate and the spring shim and the body. Now, normally when you have older shifters, this gap was around 50 thousandths. This gap typically will come in usually around 70 or even 80 thousandths. So I'm going to just measure it so we got 30. 40, 50, 60, 70, it's about 80 thousandths right here. And shim, let's just, just get a rough idea, okay? Okay, that's pretty big. That's a pretty big gap, uncompressed. Now, when we compress this down, you can probably get around, a little bit around 70 thousandths. Usually the bodies are gonna compress to around 20 thousandths. The problem with this type of gap, and let me just pop off the shield here. You can see on the bottom, you have this huge gap again between the shift gates. Okay, I call these gates, it's basically the reverse gate, the one, two gate, and the three, four gate. Let's pull out the alignment pin. Again, look at the gap there, all right? Now, when you're shifting, one of the problems that you will encounter with some of these new shifters is that it will hang up on the two to three shift. That's because you have a plunger that's on this gate and it's got a transverse into this gate. In the process of shifting, if you were to go straight through the pattern, like go say from first to second, up to neutral, over the third and up, it'll be fine. But if you try to go from first to second and then shoot diagonally like that into third, the plunger is gonna come out of this gate, it's gonna stay in second gear, and then go into neutral and hang the shifter up. This is the most common issue when you have a transmission where it's kind of stuck in second gear, then you have to go underneath the car and manually turn the lever and pull it out of second gear. What's happened here is that the plunger has gotten out of sync with the gates and stuck in between them. This is a common problem with some new shifters. Now I happen to have here the same shifter, new old stock, and I just want to show you, this was a broken shifter, they broke the handle off of it, it's an 8014 shifter, and if you could see the gap in this older unit, this is a unit that was built in the early 70s from what the person told me. And I just want you to see how close this is. Now, usually if I measure this, it's going to be right around, let's see, 
about 50,000. So let me see if I can get this in here. It's about, see, 50. Usually I find that the oldest shifters had a clearance of about 50, 54 thousandths. You can also check down here if you want and go this way. The shift I'm going to repair later, okay? But again, you've got about 50 thousandths, 54 thousandths, somewhere around there is where it's going to end up being. Where this shifter here, okay, we can see how much slop the plates have this way, right? Huge amount of difference there, right? It's ridiculous. Let's go take this one apart real quick and show you some other issues. Now, normally on these new shifters, because they're very sloppy, just take this off here, you can pretty much pop these bodies apart pretty easy. But any new shifter I sell, I have to take them completely apart and fix these gap issues. All right, so leaving these shims and gates in here, let me put the one, two gate in. What you want to see here, if I hold it down, is how much that plunger is coming outside of the gate, okay? You see that? Now what happens is that plunger, okay, when it's down into this position here and compressed this way, it's going to be also hanging out of this gate. And it's going to be rubbing against this gate. It's kind of going to be going back and forth and sliding over this gate. So what I do is I get rid of the 37,000 shim and I make my own 50,000 shims. So basically when I put it together, I'll just show you what it looks like. You'll have a better alignment of the plunger not coming through. In other words, the wall of the plunger is staying within the diameter of the gate. It's still protruding out, and you do need this, so it kind of feeds itself into this. All right, that's, that's part of the shifting process. So you need to have it above it, and when it shifts over, it will be above this one as well. But that's what lets it kind of go into the other gate properly when you're power shifting. So we're going to clean this shifter up. One of the other tricks I do is get a pair of pliers here. Let's see if we get this out. This is your reverse plunger. A lot of times, let's see if it does it on this one. I put it in the other way, and you can see it doesn't go in here all the way. It's kind of hanging up. Sometimes I have to deburr them to make them fit better. So I think I have one over here I deburred. So you can see it fits in better like this. So what happens is even though that these don't travel fully, if they do or somebody pushes it hard into reverse, this plunger is going to hang up in the body and get stuck. So what we're seeing is a lot of these new carriers, this is what this piece is called here, have issues where the plungers themselves are kind of hanging up in the carriers. So if you hear this noise like this, this burrs on this carrier inside the, the ID of where this plunger goes. And so that can kind of scrape and wear out the plunger and kind of make this funny noise that you might feel in the shifter. I'm sure it'll break in after a bit and it'll go smooth, but I like to pop the plunger out and deburr the inside diameter of the bore that the plunger fits into. And the other thing I'll do is I'll swap out these split roll pins for coil wound roll pins. The coil wound roll pins simply have a better tensile strength to them and a better shear strength through them. These tend to bend over time, so I like to swap these out for coil wound pins. So let's get to it and fix this issue up over here, deburr that, and get that cleaned up. Much better, a lot less scraping noise. With a little grease on this, it should be nice and quiet now. 
Perfect. What I do is I deburr all the the hard edges where there could be slight little dings or raised metal since all these parts are stampings. And just go over the edges and see if there's any high spots and clean them up. We want to be able to get this is the reverse plunger and we want to be able to get that so that it just drops through the body nice and easy. And the other thing I want to do too is I want to make sure that this piece fits in nice this way. Okay, which it does. So we want to be able again to make sure that this fits in good this way. Now it drops down. Okay. That's important because a lot of times if you don't do this, these new shifters will hang up in reverse. This has got to be nice and free. All right, so I just want to run through the internals of the shifter. So this is the carrier. Kind of deburred this section here where the selector pin goes through. It's nice and smooth now. I also have the reverse plunger. I make sure that it drops down. These reverse plungers, a lot of times, the new ones have a lot of dings in them. And you can see I've kind of deburred and cleaned up a lot of the high spots on the plunger. So it can actually just drop in. I check it that way again. And I'll check it this way and make sure that it fits through that okay. So that's good to go. So select the pin, reverse plunger carrier, all done. Now I want to address on some of the straight receivers. In other words, the ones that don't go over to the side or left, just the common straight receivers. These receivers tend to have a little bit of a sharp edge in them right over here. It's a little, I don't know if you can see that, but it, it's a kind of, it's not a nice smooth contour. And so oftentimes when the plunger fits through it, it's not seating correctly. It's kind of pushing it over to one side. So I use this kind of stone and I deburr them so I get a finish that looks like this. All right. And just to compare, here are some of the older receivers from the 70s. You could see that the contouring is nice and uniform all the way around. So the selector pin really fits in that nice. Okay. And compared to this one here that hasn't been cleaned up, the selector pin doesn't have a good fit to it. So I deburr them so it has a little bit of a better fit. Okay, it looks good. And that's what I do on that. So, okay, on the gates, here we got your 3-4 gate, your 1-2 gate, and your reverse gate. I'll deburr the inside areas of the gate with the Fordham, where you can use a Dremel tool using one of these blades again or one of these stones. And get in there simply and just kind of put a little bit of a radius along the edge like this all the way around. Clean up these edges like this. All these kind of hard edges that are, that are straight and square. A lot of times if there's a little bit of a divot or a ding in them, that may prevent the plates from nicely sitting against the shims and also prevent the selected pin from nicely going through these passages of the gates. So if you have a burr on the gate in the inside over here, your selected pin may get a weird feeling in neutral. So by just kind of beveling the edges a little bit like this, cleaning these edges up, getting rid of some of the imperfections of the stamping, cleaning up any of the hard edges that may have a little bit of burr on them, at least I can get a little bit better shifting action and a little bit cleaner travel of the selector pin through the gates. So let's take a look at these shifter housings. And this is what I want to show you. Is this black housing is a early housing. It has Hearst Competition Plus embossed into the housing. All right. Most of these early housings will have the patent number on them and maybe several patent numbers as the years went by. The later housings have a different phosphate. This is a gray phosphate coating. This is a black phosphate coating. The later housings that, are, that you'll see today have Hearst Competition Plus etched into them. They're smooth. But the problem with the housings that are later is that there's a difference in the gauge thickness. These housings, they tend to run around 175 thousandths gauge. See that? And these will run about 10 thousandths thicker. 185. So essentially what you have is an opening that's 20 thousandths, 10 thousandths on each side, larger than this shifter. And as a result, you'll have more gap in the spacing of the, the gates inside the shifter. So we obviously corrected some of that with this thick shim that I use on the plunger mechanism over here, but we need to fix that dimensions still inside the, the body, okay? So what I do is I manufactured 
different plates. I make this plate here that's 10 thousandths, and I make another plate that's 20 thousandths. And I slide it behind this plate like this so that when it's in the shifter, I restore that error in the gauge. All right. Now I make two of them, one that's 10 thousandths and one that's 20 thousandths. Some of them are actually a little bit wider and I have to correct them some more. But that usually takes care of the problem. So some people, what they'll do is they'll take two of these shim plates and put them together to make up the difference and tighten up the shifter. The problem with doing that is that you're going to end up putting too much tension on the gates themselves. You're going to have the two gates that are rubbing together. They're going to be rubbing together basically harder and you're going to feel it in the shifter. So where this way it's just kind of keeping the same tension of one plate but just fixing the correction of the gauge thickness of the body. Okay, so that's how I do that. So here's your conventional roll pin that's in the Hurst shifter. And you can see it's a nice pin. It's 5 30 seconds in diameter. And that's what they look like. I'm trying to get it in there. See that? All right. And what I use is I use these coil wound pins. And the coil wound pins have a thicker wall to them, which gives it a stronger pin in general. And you got to just make sure that you put them in with the end of the coil facing away from the pivot mechanism. So here's what that looks like. Okay, so I got the new shifter on my test mount. I have a, basically it's a, a, a super shifter mount clamped in a vise. I got a beater stick I use all the time. I bolt it to the shifter so I get some good action on and good leverage so I can see how it feels. And you can see it, it feels, feels really good and smooth. This is going from first to second over to third and fourth. It's like effortless. It kind of just does it by itself, which is amazing. It'll just kind of go right into third and fourth from one, two, like nothing. Just boom, it's there. And then just make sure it's all lined up here. Just check the reverse action. Reverse is good. It feels good. Now what I'll do is I'll get you a little close-up shot so you can see the gates and how tight they are and what they look like. All right, so I got this new shifter all together. It's on one of my test mounts. And I've got the 50,000 shim over here. And I've got my 10,000 shim behind the wave shim. And we should have around 25,000 now, which is what I like. So you can measure it from the top or the bottom. But there we are, got a perfect 25 thousandths clearance on there. Okay, so now when you shift this thing, what I want you to notice is we're going to go into the 1-2 gate, which is the one in the middle, and then we're going to go to the 3-4 gate. The wave spring is going to keep the 3-4 gate pressed against the 1-2 gate. And so by raising the 1-2 gate closer and above the selector pin, you don't have too much of a bump. If you watch, you could see that it kind of is rubbing against it, which is normal. Watch the motion going this way of the wave spring against the 3 4 gate as I hold it. So we're, the idea is now is when we're in neutral like this, we go from first to second, and we're going to just go right over to third. The punch is going to snap right in and then move the other gate. And it almost ha happens instantaneously when you shim these up correctly. We can go from first to second and then just slam it up and we're going right into third like this. So I'm holding these with my fingers as best as I can. And the other is reverse, is an extra little action for reverse and works the reverse gate. And when the plungers are working correctly for reverse, we bring it back, it automatically will just snap it back into place like that. So that's how the shifter sets up when it's in proper working condition. If this gate has got too much slop in it, the the selected plunger is going to come out in between both gates and jam up the shifter. All right, here's that 8010 assembly all done. And if you remember, in the beginning of the video, this had a huge gap here. Now the gap is a lot less than it was. And taking a feeler gauge, it measures around 50 thousandths here. Get it in here. There you go, 50 thousandths, all right? And Normally, when you compress it now, these will go down to around 25,000. So roughly, you're going to be compressing the bodies. You're going to lose around 20 to 25,000 clearance. And usually uncompressed, they should be around 50, 55,000 clearance. That's pretty much the standard for a lot of the older shifters. And again, the newer shifters are way out of whack. They're 80,000 and then uncompressed and then 50,000 compressed, which would allow a lot of hangups in the shifter. So... Here it is all together. Looks fantastic. It's going to go out the door today. So after I'm done assembling the shifter, I like to use nylon ties to hold it together. 
Factor uses some really thin ties. I use three very large ties to keep the body compressed. Oftentimes in shipping, these plates will pop off and the dust shield inside here will also pop off. So this keeps everything together. I recommend that people keep the shifters together with the ties and until you're ready to bolt it to the mount plate, then you cut the ties off. And I also serialize all the builds. So I have a record of them. So then what we want to do is to add a final touch as I do this. Because you've got to represent the brand. Now, I forgot to mention something. On my YouTube channel, there's about four other videos on rebuilding Hearst Competition Plus shifters. And they go anywhere from like basic cleaning, disassembly, reassembly to full rebuilds. And the reason why I didn't do full rebuild on this video, because it's been done before in several other videos, and I just really wanted to point out, again, the mods I do to new shifters. So please check out those videos. I'll post some links below in the description. And check them out, and please subscribe to my channel. Got more videos coming up. Thanks very much for watching this one, and please subscribe to my channel. Much appreciated. See you soon.